Welcome back to the Let's Talk Universal podcast sponsored by the UWI, uh, a podcast that explores how organizations can foster neurodiversity in their workforce. And today I am joined by Nick Bruno, VP of People and Culture at Aspiritech, an organization powered by a neurodivergent team. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I am very happy to be here. I, I appreciate the invite and, you know, uh, I, I'm excited for any opportunity to to brag about Spiritech and, and the awesome work that we're doing. Absolutely. And this is a perfect opportunity for that because um, we're going to get right into it. Uh, but I think first it would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about you and um, what your background is. Sure. So I have been in the human resources field for about about 10 years now, and I've, I've been with Spiritech for about the, the last year, uh, actually just a little bit over a year. I, I started in September of, of last year at, at the organization. And, you know, uh, human resources has always been a, a great thing to find myself in. But as I progressed and, and moved up in my career, I found there was a real lack of connection with the the people in the organization, and so I was so happy to to found to have found the Spirit Tech and to have joined a mission driven organization where you know the the people really are the focus. And my day to day isn't you know let's let's talk about how we can maximize people to make more money. It's about you know let's talk about how we can maximize the benefit that we are bringing to the people in our organization. So it's 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 really really great that you know my my career has sort of led me to this point uh, with with the Spirit Tech. And, and what is it that drives you and inspires you in your current role as the VP of, of people and, and culture? Um, I suppose it is that that driving the people as opposed to, you know, how do we maximize people for money? So I, I think what drives me is kind of a, a shift of the the priorities uh, that I've traditionally learned from from being in human resources, which was kind of, you know, step one is protect the business at all costs step two was you know protect the profits you know the the bottom line and step three was you know if we can maybe maybe help some people out along the way that's you know that's good you know if you have time for it and you know at at a spirit tech you know that's that's really completely reversed, you know, not that you ignore protecting the business and, you know, you need to actually operate to support your organization. But first and foremost, it's if we have the means to do it, to support our staff, and there is going to be some benefit there, we are going to do it. We are going to explore doing it as long as it's, you know, something that's not going to drive us out of business. You know, we, we are looking to do anything and everything that we can to support our employee base and being part of an organization that that actually means it when when they say it you know i i'm used to telling people that you know if an organization tells you that we're we're a family that that that's a huge red flag mm -hmm. uh but you know at 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 a spirit tech you know we we don't say that that we're a family but we we certainly treat each other like you know people who are who are very important to us because because they are it is it is the mission and was that the reason that you kind of chose to work for a spirit tech or were there a couple of other factors that that drove you to joining the organization i i will say it's it's the culture that attracted me to a spirit tech more more than anything else when i had my my interview with with tara who is the the ceo at spirit tech she told me that there is an opportunity here to help make a spirit tech what your vision is of kind of the the best organization to possibly work for and i don't know why but when she said that i i just believed her and it it has been true you know any any and every idea that that i've had or that the employees have had that i've said i think this is a great idea let's run with it let's try this let's do it it's been met with okay let's let's give it a shot you know there are no barriers that have been put up from trying to make it a better workplace from a people point of view. And let's talk a little bit about Spiritech then. Um, do you mind explaining what it is and, and how it started? So Spiritech is a, an organization that does quality assurance 
testing, uh, as well as kind of like some accessibility work and uh, data analysis for, for companies that hire us. And what makes us unique is our mission is to employ uh, adults on the autism spectrum. So how a Spirit Tech began was there was a, a husband and a wife who had uh, who have an autistic son, and they were they were working with organizations in our local community here in the Chicagoland area, and all that they were able to find was organizations that were. That, that were giving work, but it wasn't work that you could build a career out of. <clears throat> so they they started Spiritech to provide meaningful employment as well as that that social opportunity for adults on the, the autism spectrum. So, you know, Spiritech has, has really boomed. We have about a uh, hundred employees here and, you know, really present at all levels of our organization are neurodiverse adults. So that's that that's really, really awesome. You know, the the business has grown, the employee base has grown, and everything just feels like it it has kind of happened or organically. A uh, couple couple really interesting things about uh, about Aspiratech is that you know we we are a a nonprofit organization, but we are mostly driven by our our client services. You know, over ninety percent of our our revenue comes from the work that we are doing from clients, and not from donations that that we are are bringing in. So, you know, big opportunity for the organization that we're set up that way as as a nonprofit and how we have have been operating. But I I think it's it's really cool that we are this nonprofit mission-driven organization, but we aren't reliant on, you know, monetary support from the community to to keep our business growing. It's it's really a, a testament and showing that, you know, this this is what's possible if if you just make a commitment to doing it. Absolutely. And I just want to kind of uh find out a little bit more about um the customers that Aspiritech has and and what problem it's helping them to solve what is the business of spiritech oh so it it is a a wide range of things i i would say uh one of the particular niches or or our biggest uh area of business has been quality assurance testing in in the audio space our our largest client is is bose you know bose headphones sound system those those sort of things uh and we we test all manner of of products uh, from them. We we have other other audio clients, and then we have uh, clients that are on the the software side of things as well. You know, I from the the software clients. I don't know which clients I'm allowed to say that we yeah. have. I just know I'm allowed to say and champion that that Bose is our our biggest and and largest clients. But we help with you know, the quality assurance testing for audio products, for, for software, whether it's going to be something that is customer facing or something that's just going to be an, an internal thing as well. Accessibility testing for those, those products that, that software program apps or, or on websites as well. And also uh, data services as well. You know, if, if a client has something that maybe they would have traditionally outsourced, maybe it's it's data entry, Salesforce cleanup, something like that. We we've helped clients with with those things as well. Quite as you say, quite a broad spectrum of, of things there. And um, as you mentioned as well, um, a huge part of Aspiritex DNA is uh, the neurodiversity of its people. Could you? Give us a little bit more detail about the diverse makeup of the organization, sort of what what makes up the people. Yeah, so as uh, about 90, 95% of our staff uh, is on the on the autism spectrum, uh, which is great. That That is both people who are, are clinically uh, diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum and those who uh, self-identify as, as being neurodivergent or, or being autistic. Uh, and a real, real interesting thing and, and something that we love about the organization is, you know, when when you have this this makeup and this diverse group of of people, whether it's neurodivergent or or something else, you we've seen a higher level of comfortability as identifying as in parts of other groups as well. You know, we we took uh, an engagement survey at the end of last year, and I'm I'm excited to do our next one at the end of this year, where we also learned that one in four of our 
uh, team members also identifies as LGBTQIA+, which which is great. So we're we're a, a super diverse uh, organization, you know, when when it comes to to neurodiversity, but also other forms of of diversity as well. And to to try and to try and foster that, you know, we we really have a bunch of different support groups in our organization. Uh, and maybe before I talk about the support groups, I'll. I'll say a little bit about our support structure in general at Spirit Tech, because I think what makes us so successful as an organization is our support team, uh, which is which is run by uh, Rhiannon Stone, who just does an amazing, amazing job uh, with with our support at the organization. But each team member is assigned a support person. And this support person acts as, you know, maybe sometimes a job coach, maybe sometimes kind of a, a workplace therapist. It is the person that they're connected to immediately upon hired who will work through them with any accommodations that, that they may need. Maybe it's a specific kind of work environment and they're inside the office, you know, changing the lighting, you know, maybe a different tactile feel on, on keyboards that they may have or it could be uh, something else. You know, maybe they're someone who is in a, a supervisory position, but they have uh, a really hard time taking notes in meetings and uh, keeping track of that. And the support person can, can join these more important meetings and help take notes for them, help keep people organized, you know, and, and finding resources uh, to enable everybody to, to be successful. Because I, I think a lot of times you, not not even with neurodiverse people. Uh, you know, a, a neurotypical individual can can have maybe everything right there to be super successful, but they struggle with just one particular area. And our our support team is there to help with that one particular area or those other areas to make sure that that person can be as successful as they possibly can be in the workplace. You know, I wish all organizations would would dedicate some resources to uh, to have a, a support person. You know, I could certainly say there are definitely definitely times in my career where I could have benefited greatly uh, from having that. But our our support system also has these. Uh, these dedicated groups to to help kind of support team members or for team members to to get together and support each other, you know, based on different things they may be experiencing in their life. We have uh, a women's group. There is an LGBTQIA plus group. There is uh, a parents and caregivers group, you know, and an over forty group. Uh, and if there is any other thing that that comes up, you know, they just, they reach out and say, Hey, you know, th this is what I'm, I'm experiencing. You know, you think we can get together and talk about this, see if other people may be experiencing the same thing and a, a support group can be created to, to try and help with, with that. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry. I think I might've forgot the first part of that question and just went off on my su support tangents uh, with, with the spirit attack. No, but I think that that's really valuable um, to share because um, I, I imagine that, you know, a spirit tech wouldn't do that if they didn't find some value out of it as well. They wouldn't just offer up uh, support if they didn't feel that there was some kind of knock on effect to their business. And, um, and I imagine that kind of, uh, impacts customer uh, experience as well for a spirit tech is that you uh, I, I don't know if perhaps you have any examples of how the neurodiversity or even the diversity of your workforce impacts customer outcomes as well so when it when it comes to having a a neurodiverse workforce and impacting our our customers outcome that that is something i kind of shy away from from talking about because i i think that was uh, a little bit of a growing pain for our our organization, and I'll, I'll explain that by we are constantly looking for feedback from from our staff. And earlier in when when Aspiratech was kind of more more recently created years ago, the the organization has been around for about fifteen years now. Uh, they really advertised kind of neurodivergency or or autism as a kind of quality assurance superpower so to speak that you know here's these group of people who are very sensitive to uh to changes or or things that are out of place and able to to really utilize that neurodiversity as you know a, like i said a quality assurance superpower to be very good at that kind of task 
And the feedback from the employee base was that, you know, this is this is kind of offensive. You know, that this is not something that that we want to uh have advertised out there, you know, uh, and that was something that the the business took and and grew with. You know that that's not something that you will see us uh, advertise or recommend that organizations advertise is kind of saying, "Hey, neurodivergent people are are super good at this." You know, let's kind of leverage autism as as a, a business opportunity, which is, you know, not not something that I I would feel comfortable saying. And and I would hope a, a workforce would not kind of phrase something that kind of sounds like that. But you know, it's it's bound to happen and all organizations are going to learn and grow as neurodivergence see, you know, kind of becomes a a more well-known and, and understood topic in regards to the workplace. So, you know, when when it comes to how our 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 business makeup translates into client results, I think that has to do with our our company culture. You know, employees who are happy are good employees. You know, no one is going to perform better than someone who is happy to be at work and is happy to be doing what they're doing and is happy to be at your organization. You know, you have these super large, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 10 companies that are kind of able to just churn and burn people and have them work at maximum efficiency all the time because when they're burned out and go someplace else, they have just a line of people a mile long willing and wanting to take that place so they can put you know, that big company name on on their resume, but smaller organizations, you know, people who aren't in this for, for-profit for world, people who are existing to want to maximize making money and maximize making people happy, you know, you can't forget that making people happy part. If you take care of your workforce, they are going to take care of their business. They're going to take pride in the work that they're doing, and that's going to translate into the client results. Absolutely. And and I, I completely understand your, your reasoning there. And actually, some of the things that are kind of um, highlighted from what you've just said to me is, is that there's um, communication with the employees themselves, you know, having that two way dialogue, what are they happy with? What are they not happy with? And also, the the piece about, um, you know, it's, it's about culture, and it's about um, perhaps more than, you know, neurodiversity, as you say, is more about, you know, the overall uh, business. Um, and as we've mentioned, you know, we are talking about neurodiversity today, um, but you've said that 95 or roughly 90% of your uh, workforce self-identifies as neurodivergent um, across multiple levels of your business. And um, I, I think that's extraordinarily high. And a lot of people are, are going to be very interested by that, that statistic. And why do you think that is? Does it come down to culture and, and them feeling comfortable to identify themselves to a spirit tech in that way? I, I I think so. I, I think that really comes with the the level of comfortability that your staff has in 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 you. You know the the faith that they have that you know if if you check a box that says I have a disability that that's not going to be used or or looked down on or 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 anything like that. Our staff, you know, we we don't specifically target. Uh, a neurodivergent audience when we hire for our our analyst positions it you know we are a mission driven organization so or organically based on what we do based on the mission of hiring you know autistic adults and providing meaningful employment we are going to attract a much larger candidate pool of of neurodiverse talent just organically by the nature of our business existing and doing what what it's doing but when uh, someone fills out an application to to work on Asperitech, it's just a, a yes no question. You know, have you been diagnosed or do you I identify as you know someone who is neurodivergent, someone who is on the on the autism spectrum? And if if they say yes, that that is good enough for us. You know, there <clears throat> there definitely is a. Uh, it, at least in in the United States, a a very real socioeconomic barrier when it comes to going through you know some 
can be pretty pretty extensive and, and expensive uh, psychological testing or, or evaluation in order to get a diagnosis, especially for people who weren't diagnosed as children. You know, we, we find with with some of our our people, uh, our, our team members who are who are parents who who are caregivers, they actually weren't diagnosed until they were an adult. You know, they had children, and their children uh, or child was diagnosed, and it was kind of like, well, wait a minute, I see a lot of myself in in my child here, and then they pursued a diagnosis and ended up getting a uh, uh, an autism spectrum uh, diagnosis as well. And I think that that's that story is becoming much more common now is is later diagnosis um, as, you know, children and friends and family uh, go through diagnosis themselves. And um, I suppose with I, I just kind of want to reflect back on the support members that, you know, are, are in your organization to help people kind of uh, do their job uh, well and to help kind of bridge those gaps where, you know, the areas where they might struggle. Um, I'm guessing that's for all workers within a spirit tech and you don't require someone to self-identify as, as neurodivergent to provide those resources. They're just there for everyone. Correct. They are just there for for everyone. You you don't have to be in that, you know, five, six percent of our staff who identifies as being neurotypical in order to have access to the the support team. And when we talk about um your recruitment processes and how they're not particularly targeted at neurodivergent candidates they're kind of you know they're, they're there for everyone to apply what we've kind of briefly mentioned what kind of things you do differently in that process to keep that neurodiverse friendly but are there any other kind of pieces to that recruitment process that you think is drawing people in and is actually resulting in you hiring majoritively neurodivergent candidates? That's a long question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's an absolutely great question. And I think the steps that we take in our hiring process to make it uh, neurodiverse friendly is what really leads us to identifying some really, really great uh, neurodivergent talent. You know, traditionally an interview process is you you apply for a job, you maybe you have a phone screening, you have an interview, maybe two interviews, you know, maybe an excessively huge amount of interviews, depending on the organization. And then eventually maybe you might get a job offer at a spirit tech. You know, if if you do more than than two interviews, there's there's something seriously wrong or it's or it's, uh, you know, a, a high level position, you know, and we we try to make it as comfortable as possible by giving uh, people options. You know, you're you're not going to walk into an, an interview at a spirit tech, whether it be for the the internship program or the uh, a QA position, without having all of the the questions in front of you in advance, so so you can prepare. You're not going to walk into an interview not knowing exactly what it's going to look like because you're going to be asked your preferences. Would you like it to be a, a Zoom call, a, a, a Google Meet, you know, a phone call? Would you like cameras to be on, cameras to be off? You know, if there's a, a certain point where you might be having a hard time articulating something, would you be more comfortable, you know, typing your, your answer out? You know, it's, it's about being comfortable and kind of embracing the the human experience and i i will say interestingly enough the feedback that i have gotten on our interview process and structuring things that way has been so overwhelmingly positive and most of that feedback has come from candidates who identify as neurotypical who have just been like this this has been amazing you know i've never had an interview like this before you know i feel like a person is is what i hear a lot from our our neurotypical candidates when when they go through our interview process and i think there's there's a really big lesson to to be learned there you know the the onboarding process for your organization starts during the interview you know if you are being treated like like a person, not just a number, you know, your your preferences and experiences are being respected before you're even an employee, you know, that that speaks volumes to how hopefully you will then be treated the same way when you eventually join that team. Whereas if you're just treated 
like a number from the get-go, you're probably just going to be treated like a number throughout your whole time with that organization. And um, I imagine that there are a lot of people listening to this conversation who uh, want to kind of find out what the secret sauce is mm -hmm. to not only attracting and hiring, but also retaining um, neurodivergent talent. Um, so is there anything you can kind of uh say about what a spirit tech finds successful when it comes to incorporating and retaining its talent i know that we've already spoken about these support networks and and these supporting roles um, but is there anything else that spirit tech has found really useful and valuable uh when retaining its talent uh, absolutely and i i promise you it it sounds very very easy but you will find organizations that definitely struggle with with this step and it's just it's having a feedback loop it is about communication it is about actually hearing your team members and responding to to that feedback you know if if you are making a change at your organization whether it's a good change whether it's a bad change where is your you know i'm i'm using the term term frontline but frontline employee you know where where is their voice in that change because I bet you know 99.9 .9 times out of 100 that's going to be uh, they're they're nowhere their their voice is they've they've been told what this change is you know what whether it's it's good or bad this is the change this is the new reality for for the workforce you know it it doesn't matter if you're giving people an an extra week of PTO or if you know there's another pandemic and there's, you know, no bonuses are coming out or, or wages are being reduced a little bit, whether it's a good change or bad change, you need to make sure that you are dedicating space in your process for getting feedback from your teams at different levels of the organization and that you are honestly responding and reacting to that feedback. Because most of the time, even if it's a bad change, you'll hear, you know, I understand that this is why this has to happen, but this is how it could be explained differently, or or this little change right here would would make it uh, an easier pill to swallow. And even if you're making an amazing change for your organization, you might get feedback of, "I don't understand why this is a good thing. Can can you explain that for me?" You're not just sending out an announcement and people are going, "Well." That, that sounds good, but I don't really know. You know, people don't like change. Whether you're neurodivergent or neurotypical, you know, there you will find a natural human reaction to, to resist change, whether it is good or bad. And dedicating time for feedback in your process is going to make that, that change go over much, much smoother. You know, at Aspiritech, we really take things even a step further than that, which I don't expect other organizations to to also be doing, but we have uh, what is called the Autism Advocacy Group in our organization, and anybody is allowed to be a part of it. And when we are making larger changes in the organization, or we have a change that we're making, and we want to make sure that it is both understood and comes off as uh, as neuro friendly as it possibly can be, we put it in front of this group and we ask for for feedback. And most of the time, it's just feedback of, you know, this part of it needs to be explained in a little bit more detail, or, you know, this needs to be changed because it, it sounds kind of vague and, and we need it to be clearer over here. And doing that kind of skips that step of announcing a change and getting pushback and questions and lack of understanding where you know you've you've put this in front of a group and you've gotten this this process this this announcement this change to your organization already looked at and as neuro friendly as you can reasonably get it before it's announced to your your wider employee base that sounds great it, as you say it's it's another level to that you know, two-way communication with with employees and allowing them to kind of be involved in those kinds of decisions. Um, I just wondered what the the kind of management role is in this because we've spoken a lot about the organisation. You know, provides all of this support and and for employees. And um, I just wanted to understand what the role of a manager is in um, the culture of a spirit tech and managing their teams because. 
I think there is a, a an argument to say that, you know, their role in this is just as important as that support role. Oh, it is a hundred percent just as important. I would I would say it's more important. You know, pe- people don't quit jobs, people quit managers. Uh and I would say of our kind of our 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 structure of our organization is is we have analysts, we have senior analysts. A senior analyst may or may not have an analyst or two who kind of reports up into them. Over over senior analysts, we have uh, engagement managers who are kind of like account managers. You know, they are overseeing projects, overseeing uh, specific clients. Uh, And then the engagement managers, you have the project managers who kind of oversee whole divisions, whether it be uh, accessibility testing or a a certain uh, division of the audio testing, and then and then you know the, the project managers are kind of side by side with with the senior leadership team. So the senior analysts, these these engagement managers who have the majority of the analysts uh, reporting up to them. I I think the the leadership culture and and style there is is one where people aren't afraid to ask for help you know uh at our organization you you don't find a lot of people who are just winging it you know if if someone is unsure you know they they have that that comfortability to be able to ask what's a good next step for this or here is how i plan on approaching this situation is this a good idea do you have any advice for me uh and and i think that that culture that we have there really helps to have you know the the passion for the people trickle down uh all the way throughout the organization because you know the, the the number one step that you need in order to have a good workplace culture is is you need to have leadership buy in and if the leadership is completely and totally bought in then your managers will be bought in then your supervisors will will be bought in uh, so i i think that's that's what it is is we've been able to to build a team and have an environment where where people are just okay and willing and happy to to ask for help and not only that you know help is just offered you know i i don't think you would leave any kind of of team meeting at spirit tech without without somebody going you know if you need help with this let me know or you know hey you know you want to run this by run your ideas by me but before this goes live or before you have this conversation you know do you, you want to talk about it before this happens so we can you know make sure this is happening as as good as it can be and um I, I believe from from my kind of searching around and, and looking into a spirit tech that it's involved in advocating for neuroinclusion as well um, and best practices kind of in the workforce. Um, what kind of things is it involved with sort of perhaps outside of day to day operations? I I am not the best person to to answer this question, uh, but this this is definitely something that we are taking a a huge step forward with in uh, in 2024 and at the end of the new year. You know, we recently brought on a uh, a marketer. You know, now all of our marketing is is coming in house. Her her name is is Sarah Clark. She you know openly identifies as as someone on on the autism spectrum, and she. She is amazing. She's bringing uh, a lot of a lot of great energy into the organization and and leading the this marketing charge here, of you know the the advocating, the showing. These are our best practices. This is what you can do too. You know that that's not my area of expertise. You know, getting out and shouting it from the rooftop and and letting you know uh, people know and advocating for for neuro inclusion. I I love doing it. It's just not you know something that. Is is the bread and butter in in my day to day at Spiritech? Uh, I I will say that we we have uh, an arm of our business that will be advertised more in uh, in in 2024, which is actually you know consulting with other organizations. You know, saying uh, uh, someone comes to us and says, "I want to be a more neuro friendly organization." in these areas you know it it could involve myself it will involve uh, at least one person who identifies as neurodivergent to 
take a look at the process, take a look at, at what they're doing or hear their ideas or even just have uh, some some lunch and learns or or more large scales meetings with them about how they can be a more neural uh, inclusive uh, work environment or have more neural inclusive uh, practices uh, as as an organization themselves. So some exciting things to to come during you know 2024 and and with the arrival of your new marketing role. So I look forward to seeing what you guys get up to, and I'm sure um, others will would like to follow uh, the story of Aspiratech as it kind of ventures further into this uh, this area. And um, I suppose the neurodiverse culture of Aspiratech partly comes down to the fact that it was it was built that way from the beginning. So for the majority of organizations that perhaps haven't started that way, um, do you think there's still hope for them to kind of turn it around? Oh, there, there is absolutely still hope. You know, if I'm just throwing a wild guess out there, even if you're not an organization that is built with uh, neurodivergent people in mind, if I had to hamper a guess, probably somewhere you know, around 20% of your organization is someone who either personally or publicly identifies as neurodivergent, whether that is, you know, autism spectrum, whether it is, you know, a, a form of ADD, ADHD, you know, dyslexia, or, or, or something else, you know, you, you have a neurodiverse workforce, whether you think you do or, or not, just as, you know, you, certainly have a a racially or or gender you know diverse workforce or not but you know that that is diversity that that you can see you know neurodiversity is is something that that is invisible so i i think it's taken us longer as 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 a global culture to to recognize and put emphasis on that uh so what i would say is the the absolute best thing that you can do is just be good to your people. You know, making your your processes, your organization, uh, neuro inclusive, neuro friendly is going to greatly benefit everybody at your organization and not just your neurodiverse staff. You know, like I mentioned previously with with our interview practices, the loudest and best feedback that I get is from people who identify as as neurotypical. So I I. I promise you, you know, any any one part of an organization who who is listening to this, you know, make make an effort, make it make it a core value, you know, be a neuro friendly employer and you are going to see absolutely amazing results in your workplace, both from your uh, neurodivergent team members and from your neurotypical ones as well. And um, I just wanted to ask if. Uh... So there were changes and 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 progress that Aspiritech is also looking to see within its own organization. Because I imagine that you know this is always an ongoing process, always learning how how to best adapt for your workforce. So so is there anything that Aspiritech is looking to change or do better? Uh, we we are always looking to to change and and do better. I would say most specifically and most recently, we we took a look at how our positions and roles are are titled, what the job descriptions look like, the reporting structures look like, and made changes to that to both make it make more sense as a business and make it make more sense, you know, in a neuro in inclusive environment. Because, you know, our our org structure kind of looked like, you know, there was an analyst, there is analyst one, two, three, four, five. There was a lead, there is kind of lead one, two, three, four, five. And we 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 did away with a system that had a lot of ambiguity behind it and made it something that was much more concrete but still had this this flow and this growth that could be visualized for what it looks like to progress your career at the spirit tech uh so so that is kind of the the big thing that we're working on right now is is eliminating the the ambiguity when it comes to our positions and our job titles and and making it something that you know makes the most sense for for our workforce and for our our business you know, if if you ask me this question a month from now, two months from now, 
I'm going to have a different answer for you because we're, we're kind of always listening to feedback and trying to, to mold our organization to be the best it possibly can. And that is an ever-changing thing based on the needs of our employees. So, you know, we, we could make this change right now and three years from now, we get the feedback that, hey, this is the issue that we have with this system. This kind of doesn't make sense. And then we we revisit it and and we change it again. So it's it's listening, uh, it's it's constantly learning, and and it's adapting to the feedback that we get. Yeah, it sounds um, uh, cyclical in in terms of you know finding that momentum and and you know listening to feedback and and um, you know seeing what you can do about it and then going back and then you know seeing what you can do next and um, not trying to accomplish everything all at once because um it could be quite overwhelming i can imagine um, yeah and i we've kind of spoken about quite a, a few things but before we finish is there anything that you would like to add that perhaps we haven't touched on or or emphasize a point that we've briefly touched on you know i i would say that if your your business and emphasizing this point of get again is if your business is committed to doing good for for your people that the the business results are are going to speak for themselves you know if if you're paying your your people well if you're treated them well if you are allowing them to have the time off that they need if you're allowing them to be a human being first and a member of your organization second i think that's that's what it it really comes down to you know taking you know being uh neuro inclusive neuro friendly uh, aside you know what what it comes down to is is just letting people in embrace the human experience and and supporting them on their journey well thank you nick it's been an incredibly interesting uh, conversation uh, to learn more about aspiritech and its neurodiverse workforce uh, and i'm sure our listeners uh, will agree that there is something to be learned from your organization its story and its you know best practices and and i look forward to seeing more uh, from aspiritech in the future um and of course if anyone would like to learn more about aspiritech its services and its people then they can uh, follow the link that will be available on the, the podcast webpage. Um, but once again, I really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and, and sharing your insights on um, how to foster neuro inclusion in the workplace. Yeah, it's it's really my pleasure. I'm I'm very happy to have been to been a part of it. So thank you for the opportunity to do so. No worries. Thank you so much, Nick. Speak to you soon. All right. Take care.